Hey my friends, it's your old pal Jordan the Lion. How are you all doing today? I hope you said great. I'm doing great, but today is gonna be a little bit of a sad vlog for us. As you can tell, we're in the cemetery here in Wadesboro, North Carolina, and we're here to pay our respects to one of the great fallen heroes of the wrestling industry. He was once known as <laughs> the Junkyard Dog, Sylvester Ritter had a very tragic short life, passed away at the age of 45. And I wanna talk about how influential and how loved he was in the wrestling industry and how his life was sadly ended at the age of 45. Days with Jordan the Lion, it begins right now. So if you'd like to come out and visit Sylvester Ritter yourself, he's at Westview Memorial Park. Let's see if we can find the great junkyard dog. I believe from here, there's a little building behind here and I think he's buried right over in this section. For a long time, didn't even have a headstone. I know it's kind of in bad taste because it's a cemetery, but being a junkyard dog fan, I just want to start barking right now. <laughs> That's what everybody would do when he was in the ring. He'd start barking, he'd start barking and the chance of JYD filling the arena. So I found him, he's actually right almost over by the woods. And the way that you can find him is if you come over here, the biggest headstone over here, actually not his, it's his, his daughter, Latoya Ritter. She has a pretty sad death as well. But the great one, junkyard dog right here. Hoo, 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 hoo. I can't help it, couldn't help myself. The great Sylvester Ritter. Known as the Junkyard Dog, JYD. I think his name when he got started was like Big Papa Ritter when he was in Stampede. He got started with Jerry Jarrett, but there he is. They don't have him in his custom thump trunks. No chain, none of that stuff, none of the gimmick. So Sylvester Ritter was actually born and raised out here in this town in North Carolina. And he was a local football star and then was a college star. Then was drafted by the Green Bay Packers and played one season for the Packers before realizing that his injuries, he had had knee problems, back problems and things like that. They were not gonna allow him to continue on. So he ended up getting involved in wrestling. And like I said, he, First started wrestling for Jerry Jarrett, and then he went up to Stampede, which was Stu Hart, the legendary Calgary wrestling dynasty up there, and became a big star. He was like, you know, not a huge star, but I mean, people were really liking him. And that was one of those, the crazy things about him. He was never a technical wrestler. Like he didn't do wrestling moves. He just basically was a guy that went in there and beat people up and threw people around, headbutted people. But for some reason, the crowd just loved him. And so when Bill Watts took over Mid-South, um, it was time for Sylvester Ritter to move on and he was asked to come to Mid-South and became a giant, giant draw. It was once he came and started working for Bill Watts, Bill Watts was the one that came up with the idea of the junkyard dog name and the chain and the whole character and everything. Some people say, you know, I hear it now, people say, oh, that was so, racist and you know, tr having the guy act like a dog but i mean rick steiner used to bark and act like a dog too so I, I never really i guess that never equated with me my dad and i loved wrestling and i think maybe the crazier the character the better so that was this was one you know seeing the junkyard dog was the one that me and my dad always bonded over we always loved seeing jyd together and beyond all of his likability you know he was not only loved by fans when they saw him in the ring for whatever reason people just loved him he was a very charismatic guy and when you talk to people outside the ring they said he was a very lovable person there it was like hard to find anybody that didn't like him once he was there in mid-south it was a whole new ball game because this was like the first time that any big time wrestling organization had had an African-American champ. They, it was just not something that was done there. And Mid-South, it had, you know, a lot of pros and cons to it. You know, the pros were that, you know, a lot of, I, I forget who I saw saying this, they were saying like, you know, in those days, like we had a pretty big African-American 
fan base that was coming out to the matches and like when Junkyard Dog became champions, like this was their guy. This was finally a champion that they could relate to. But it was not only that, it was like all the fans loved him. Black, white, everybody loved him. And they would use that as part of building up his popularity. When he had a feud with Michael Hayes, uh, Michael Hayes from the Freebirds, Michael Hayes was saying all kinds of like racist comments and really antagonizing him. That just made the fans that love JYD love him even more, hate the Freebirds even more. And then they did this angle where uh, the Freebirds rubbed like hair gel or hair cream in Junkyard Dog's eyes and he was blinded. They had these spots where he was coming in and he was, his eyes were all bandaged up and he was saying that they didn't know if he was ever gonna be able to see again. And his wife had just had a newborn daughter and he couldn't even see his newborn daughter. So when he said that on TV, that was like, that changed the game. People that were fans of his became even bigger fans. They started sending in money for his doctor bills. They were writing you know, uh, notes of get well. They were threatening the Freebirds. The Freebirds said it got so out of hand that somebody actually jumped in the ring one night when they were attacking Junkyard Dog and pulled a gun out on him and the police had to get involved. They also said it got so crazy that they had to because they would, it was part of a territory, so like every Wednesday or every Saturday they would be at the same place and they would just kind of travel around the territory on the other days. They said it got to a point where when they would do like every Saturday in New Orleans, they would have to park their cars at the sheriff station, have the sheriffs drive them to the arena for the matches. To say that Sylvester Ritter Junkyard Dog was over is like an understatement. If you watch matches from back then, you hear the crowd just constantly chanting JYD and chanting all of his phrases, who gonna beat that dog, all that stuff. You'd hear them get him going and it was so cool to watch. It was so fun. Like it's when wrestling wasn't about, you know, hating the guys. It was, you, you actually really loved watching him and he held several titles. He had a lot of great feuds with like Ted DiBiase, King Kong Bundy, of course, the Freebirds. One of his best feuds I've heard uh, Butch Reed talk about was with, with Butch Reed and they said that that would never happen. They said, you know, nobody will ever pay to see two black main eventers go at it and they were super successful. They made, in fact, Butch Reed said he didn't think he'd ever made any more money than the time that he worked with Junkyard Dog. But he was so popular that when WWF came around, Vince McMahon was starting to build his roster he was picking from all of the wrestling organizations, picking some of the best talent, and he came after Junkyard Dog. Junkyard Dog decided to take off, and he eventually brought Butch Reed with him, and they continued their feud years later. Now, the main problem with Junkyard Dog was that he he had substance abuse issues. It was um, it was something that kind of everybody knew about. I've seen interviews where they said, you know, they would get word that he was seen in bad neighborhoods and when you were seen in the bad neighborhoods they knew that meant that you were there to buy crack and that was like at the height of junkyard dog's fame he was doing that his weight ballooned up he was eating a lot of junk food and really just out of shape and unreliable when he went to the wwe even though it was a really great well wwf it was a great opportunity for him he just couldn't make the most of it because he was kind of on his decline, even though he wasn't very old, he was still in his 30s, he just didn't, even though the fans loved him, he wasn't a real great worker and his body wasn't real great, so it just, they always kind of kept him as a mid-carter. He did wrestle in the first WrestleMania, the second WrestleMania, the third WrestleManias, but he never won a title while he was with the WWF at all. He had been married and had a daughter. That was also an issue at one point. His wife was institutionalized and then she kidnapped their daughter from Sylvester's parents' house. And then he went off looking for his daughter, looking for her, and broke down the door of her brother-in-law who was a cop. And then a, a shot was fired. No, you know, nobody was injured or anything, but just total craziness in his first relationship. And then he was married a second time. And apparently she took him for just about everything he had. So most of his days after WWF, he really didn't have a lot of money. He um, he went, he, he was with WWF for a couple of years and then they released him in 88 and he signed on with WCW, which was NWA and um, had a little bit of 
success there with his Butch Reed stuff, but again, he wasn't in his top form. He wasn't in great shape. And they always talk about, you know, his horrible feud with Ric Flair. And, you know, I was puzzled by this because I never remembered seeing this. And, you know, they always say Ric Flair can have a five-star match with a mop. So I went and watched the match and it's kind of interesting to see it now. Some of the wrestling magazines actually called it one of the worst matches of the year. And so I sat down and I watched it. And as I watched it, I, the first thing I noticed was that the, the clip was like only seven minutes long. That was not normal for a main event. I mean, this was a pay-per-view and Ric Flair main event for the championship cold. Kind of surprising, but as you watch it, I start noticing that, you know, it's going on like a normal match. Rick's doing a bunch of stuff, but none of it's really affecting Junkyard Dog. And then that's kind of what hit me. I go, wait a minute. This is kind of like an Ultimate Warrior match. What is what does Rick got to do for this guy to fall down? And so I started reading the comments going, I wonder what it was that people deem this to be such a bad match. Well, apparently what everybody says from different interviews they've seen, like shoot interviews with other wrestlers, they say that there was a there was a game plan for this match. And it was pretty obvious within a couple of minutes when everything that Rick did, <laughs> Junkyard Dog was no selling any of it, meaning he was not showing getting hurt he was not taking the hits like nothing he was just not selling any of it and it became pretty apparent that their plan for the match was not going to happen and a lot of people say it was because junkyard dog was just so high that he he just went off and did his own thing and so they they realized that since they were not it was not going to go the way they had planned the match to go they didn't know how rick was ever going to finish the match to win so they just had a bunch of wrestlers come do a run in and interrupt the match and everything but that was Sadly, that was when they realized that Junkyard Dog's days were behind him. Rest in peace, Sylvester Ritter. Had one of the greatest, catchiest theme songs on the WWF album. And whenever he'd come to the ring, he just, man, people got into it. Go watch one of his matches. He, didn't ha he wasn't real technical. Like I said, he wasn't really a wrestler's wrestler. He didn't do wrestling moves. A lot of punches, headbutts, and throwing people around the ring and things like that. But... Boy, the crowd was so into it. And that's why when I watched the Ric Flair match, I was kind of surprised people gave it such low ratings because the whole crowd is so into it the whole time. Now, apparently Junkyard Dog didn't know how bad he had kind of ruined his life in some ways and even told Ted DiBiase, like gave him permission to use his story as a tale to help others. And I've seen several people post in the comment section saying that they met Junkyard Dog when they were kids in the 80s and that he said to him, are you still in school? All right, you stay in school. You do, you be good. You make something of yourself. Like he was always very reinforcing, very positive. Nobody ever had like any story. I, I saw a lot of people posting where they met him at different Walmart signings and they're like, he was so nice. He was so friendly. He was like good with everyone. Nobody had a bad word to say about the guy. Unfortunately, at the age of 45 years old, he passed away in a car accident. See his daughter Latoya, the same daughter that had been kidnapped by her mother apparently, the, the story was, she was graduating high school and Sylvester came to the graduation and apparently I think he was living in Mississippi or was coming from Mississippi at the time to her graduation here and he apparently showed up late after the ceremony had already ended and she had went off to graduation parties with her friends so he didn't get a seer and he was turned around driving back to his home and i believe he had a, a single car crash his car flipped a couple of times and he passed away at the age of 45 years old now even though he didn't have a whole lot of success in the wwe they did put him in the Hall of Fame for his contributions to all of wrestling. And his daughter was the one who got to go and induct him. The sad thing is that him passing away, you can see he was 45 years old. The sad thing is that his daughter didn't even get to make it that long. You can see she was born in 1980, passed 2011. Apparently she was on the phone with a friend at the age of 31 walking down the steps and had a heart attack and dropped dead right right there. How sad. 
it's nice that she got to honor her father's legacy at the Hall of Fame, but man, what a sad story and sad ending. Well, my friends, thank you for watching. Thank you for remembering and memorializing Sylvester Ritter with me, the great junkyard dog. What a great wrestler. What a, I mean, what a great personality for wrestling. I want to thank Gwen Wilkinson for becoming my newest Patreon. Thank you all for watching. Please hit the like button. Please subscribe and ring the bell for notifications. We will see you all next time. Have a great night. Thank you.